Well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, I wish I could say something about mathematical computational approaches to language. But when I met Arvind, which was about 15 years ago, I realized, looking at him, I was neither good enough a mathematician or a linguist to do that. So I turned to child language and hoped that it would be a little easier because kids speak less and the grammar is a little more, a little simpler. But, but it turned out to be hard, too. But here I am. Okay, um, Arvin and I share another interest, I think, that's um, long-lasting. That is that we're interested in the ideas of linguistics, the history of the field, and how some of the modern ideas were formed during the, the formative years. So in the past few years, I've been having um, interviews with Arvin and uh, conversations with uh, Lila Kleinman, with uh, Morris Halley and Noam Chomsky to figure out how, you know, what things were at the time. Maybe someday I'll, I'll write a book. Okay, so um, so the the thing I want to bring up today is this notion of distributional methods, which is a central in Harris's uh, program in linguistics. And I think that's really something that all linguists do um, when we do linguistic document, language documentation and description, when we do any sort of structural analysis of uh, languages from all levels, even when we're you know constructing bizarre minimal pairs. And certainly in the development of um, NLP systems, we now try to discover distribution irregularities with statistical tools and so on. Now, this is really Harris's legacy and uh, featured prominently um, in early days. And in particular, this paper from phoneme to morpheme, which actually was implemented by Emily Pittler, who's here uh, when she was a student at, uh, at, at, at Yale, um, where I was working at the time. Actually worked you know, fairly well. Um, so this idea, of course, is revived um, more recently in, more prominently in column science. Um, uh, when we turn to distribution methods in, for language acquisition, additional set of questions arise um, because we're taking a psychological turn. So on the one hand, we're interested in, is the distributional information available in the data to children? And also, can children exploit uh, such distributional regularities to actually learn language using psychologically plausible um, mechanisms, and also we want to know does the distributional approach to learning of language um, as a model of language learning produce behavior consistent with cross-linguistic patterns of language learning? So these are kind of questions that I've been interested in. So at, in front of this very distinguished uh, set of guests, I'm going to talk about something um, that's work in progress, but I hope this is a, this is a topic that Ar Arvin would enjoy. Um, that's the phoneme to morpheme idea, as I mentioned, later adopted um, to uh, the problem of uh, finding words across um, you know, syllables. Of course, this is something that was demonstrated with, with great success that infants as well as uh, other life forms are capable of using this information to get words out of artificial languages, a famous paper in science by Saffron, Nesson, et al., but if you actually run this on real language, it doesn't work so well. You get F score about 0.3 for English. Um, I won't go in, into all the details here, but later work showed that some other linguistic property, like prosody, uh, which can come in many forms, stress or boundaries or phrasal stress and so on, appears to trump statistics when both available. And this work is now strongly demonstrated in the infant work as well as in computational work by work of a Constantine Lignos here is a student here working with me and, uh, me and Mitch. Um, so now let's deal with a new problem, which is also a, a very, very old problem. It's also a very, very hard problem. This is a vowel plot from Peterson Barney. As we know, American, vowels, uh, American English vowels has a great deal of variation. And uh, so the question we want to ask ourselves is that is there is some in distributional information in the vowels of American English such that Children can identify those categories on the one hand, and also do so reasonably early uh, under minimum assumptions of what they know at that point. So we, we don't know the facts for all vowels, but we do know that by the age of eight months, um, English infants know a, a few vowels and have formed the categories for at least a few vowels. Um, the question I want to raise here is that we, we have to think about what makes linguistic category necessary, and uh, the traditional answer is a simple one, namely, categories exist to mark distinctions. So this is the idea of in phonemics, you, you talk about minimal pairs of words. Um, and 
this is another thing that I've benefited from being at Penn, um, being the wonderful column of science and linguistics community uh, I've been part of. That is that I've been learning a lot from Bill LeBov and, and Gillian Sankoff and about how social linguistics works and how language change works. So it's apparently, um, very astonishingly, uh, phonological categories can be lost by children in very short span of time. Um, so there are two vowels in American English, the, the lot vowel and the thought vowel. I, for me, the same, so I'll, I'll say, I'll just say this, the, the lot and thought. Um, the distinction can be rapidly lost. This is drawing from work of Dan Johnson, a, a graduate student here. Um, I'll play to you audio samples of uh, four members of a, of a same family. You can hear that the parents and the older siblings actually had two vowels. It's typical of rural islands, but the younger one had, had a merger. Okay, so this study was done at the boundary of uh, Boston or the one vowel you know, system in the Boston area, the two vowel system area of, uh, of uh, Rhode Island. So we can hear them. So that's Tom, the father. That's mother. So still indifferent, but this is the nine-year-old. Okay, um, it's a very striking. So I really found it fairly astonishing. Um, so what? So apparently, children during the process of language acquisition can decide to abandon a category uh, because they started out learning the two categories of their parents. Um, so let's see what kind of calculus it would be doing to make this process possible. If you have one vowel, uh, you actually have a, a set of uh, homophonous words. So don and don, if you happen to be only have you know, one vowel, you won't be able to tell them apart. Um, and there's a strong evidence from psycholinguistics that processing of homophones is, appears to be driven by, fre by frequency, at least at the very early stage. So here's a paper by Bolin and colleagues. So I saw him duck. Many speakers here actually stumble um, for the reason that there's really two ducks. One is the verb, the other is the noun, but the noun is far more frequent. So actually you hear the more frequent form first. Okay, so if you actually have one vowel, you actually you are sometimes you know, confused. And the probability of you being confused is going to be determined by the, the frequency with which you, you hear the least frequent of the minimum pair. Um, if you have two categories, of course, they are potentially confusable. This has been um, quantified before. Um, there's a small rate of errors. So in, in previous work, I tried to work out exactly what's the tipping point such that would make the learner ad adopt one vowel system instead of two. So if, again, if you, have, you hear a mixture of inputs, some people say two vowels, some say, people say one. If you hear the one vowel system, the, as I said, the probability of you being misled is going to be the frequency with which you access the, the, the least frequency of the pair. If you hear two vowels, of course, there's going to be some constant which we can quantify, namely frequency of those minimal pairs of words, as well as the psychoacoustic confusibility, plus the, um, the, um, the frequency with which you hear the one vowel you know, system. So you can solve this equation. You get something like, uh, apparently for this COD, COD merger, you can spread with only about 18 or 17 percent of, uh, of speakers. This is actually confirmed, to my astonishment, um, by the demographic uh, surveys of children when, uh, in, in, at this boundary towns when this merger took place about 10, you know, 15 years ago. Okay, so if you're willing to believe this so far, um, or thus far, uh, we can play the game of looking at language learning as language change. So, the, so every time you hear a token, the child really faces two choices. One is to assimilate this token into an existing category or to create a new one. And what I'm simply proposing is that the child is actually doing a calculation of which one is more economical, namely which one, which of the two choices is going to lead to a lower cost of, um, uh, of, um, you know, of misperception. So I'm making some assumptions here. I'm making a strong assumption, which I'll okay, come back to momentarily, that the child, the child, the learner knows a set of words and their meanings differ. So we're really assuming some as aspects of minimal pairs here. We assume fairly uncontroversial age, children can keep track of you know, word frequencies. We also assume the learner can keep track of the category centers, F1, F2, duration, and so on. 
Okay, and uh, you only keep uh, those parameters for how many categories you have or how, how many clusters you have created so, so far. Finally, I want to assume, as we'll see um, um, reasonably, the learner also remembers the last word that's been classified into a category. Um, and there's actually good evidence that children, infants, actually learn something about some words fairly early on. So Jusik has done studies of showing at least at six month, months of age, children know the meanings of mommy and daddy. And later on, work has shown that children can use familiar words like mommy and their name to segment for new, uh, new words. And even more strikingly, recently, um, Alika Burgosson and Dan Swilling here were able to show that nine month, nine, six to nine month old infants can reliably identify daily objects, daily life objects with the sounds. So the picture that go here, you can see eggs and you can see bananas and legs and noses and, and, and so on. And I did a check of the top uh, 500 most you know, frequent words in input English words that kids hear. It turned out that minimal pairs of words can be found for almost all the major, uh, across all the uh, well, major, uh, major well, uh, categories. So I'm actually giving, going to give you an, an, an algorithm Initially, you pick a random token as a, as, a, as, a, as a very first center. Then you hear a, you hear another token. Um, you find you try to place this, uh, find the uh, the center that's closest to this new token you have heard. If the center, if the last word that, had, that belongs to the center forms a, does not form a minimal pair with the new one, then you don't do anything. This is where the, where this last word becomes relevant because you do not want to assume the learner has remembered all the words or all the tokens that have been classified into a category. By assuming they only knows one of them, um, if it happens to be a, 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 a minimal pair, great. If it doesn't, you just move on. Eventually, as you will see, you won't create a category unless um, you hear a minimal pair and also unless the minimal pair has reached certain frequency threshold that, you, uh, that, is, uh, that justifies the, the postulation of a, diff of a new category so you are not confused you know, anymore. I won't go into the details here, but basically you can do a pretty simple computation to make this decision. So I'm using the, the Helen brand at, at all vowel set. So this is the seven vowels. I'm not even doing 10 because seven is, is, is hard enough. You can see there's a great deal of overlap, which is why this is a challenging problem. Um, implementations, um, for each category, I'm using the tokens there. I'm assuming there's a small probability of some tokens within each category is going to form minimal pairs with other categories. Um, it's an it's assumption that can, be, that can be refined. As we, as we also know, um, vowels come in, in different frequencies. But if you try this long enough, it doesn't actually matter so much um, what the, the exact you know, frequencies are. Um, and vowel free, uh, word, uh, word frequencies are going to be accumulated as tokens are sampled and presented and processed by the learner. So this model, I think, is interesting because it, learning is completely online. It's incremental. It does not memorize anything other than the, than the, than the last word that's been put into a category. It's non-parametric. We're not stipulating how many centers to be looking for. We're not assuming the tokens are drawn from a Gaussian distribution or, or things of that nature. And also efficient, because every time the, the learner only needs to calculate um, the distance between the current word and the existing uh, number, of, uh, in, number of clusters. Okay, so let's try a simple case. Okay, if I give you three vials that are very, very easy to separate, it learns very well. Um, so I forgot, I forgot which, which, I think the, the so it's E, I, O, I, I think, I think the, um, the black dots are the centers I have learned, or the model has learned, and the red ones are the objective target uh, for each, you know, cluster. If you run this um, seven vowels, it gets messier and doesn't get all that great, but this is one of the better looking shots I can, you know, I can present. Uh, we can quantify this, of course. Um, when learning, you know, stops, we create some, you know, centers. When we, we, we take all the tokens again, we group every token into the closest, you know, center. Then we measure the pairwise, uh, you, know, uh, you know, precision and recall for, for, uh, for, you know, for each cluster on the idea that you want the vowels that do belong to the same category be captured by, 
by the same cluster you have learned. And it's encouraging. I'm not, uh, I can't say it's, it's doing very well, but nothing else is doing particularly well. So if you actually take the very center that's calculated from the target, you get an F score of about four, uh, 0.54. Uh, if, you give, if you do k-means, you actually you know, specify how many parameters, or how many you know, classes to look for, you get about, four, uh, about 0.47. If you do mixed Gaussian, that tries to find the optimal number of, uh, of categories as well as the distributions, you get 0.47. If you do what I just told you, you get 4 in por uh, 0.46. Okay, so this is a model that's learning the centers that re only relies on the distribution of minimal pairs and their frequencies. Actually, this is a nearly uh, acoustically independent model. I'm not really taking much of anything of their acoustic distance into, uh, um, into the calculation except for this immediate pairwise comparison. Needless to say, this is, I don't believe this is what actually happens. I think if you add some acoustic dimension, you can probably do, do a little better. Um, and uh, that's I, what I wanted to say today. And I, I think, again, I want to relate to some of Arvin's ideas that um, when we do linguistics or we, we, we do linguistic learning, sometimes we find linguistic distinctions to trump um, distinctions in some other domain or maybe in a more grounded domain. So here's a case that this appears to at least, you know, suggest that linguistic distinction over word identity is, uh, can trump acoustic differences across tokens. And this is necessary because we know across languages and also across dialects, vowel spaces are cut you know, differently. So there's no guarantee that two vowels being far apart or being fairly close to each other are going to be um, in the same category or not. And, and also I feel that, uh, again, carrying on the Harris legacy that both Arvin and I are, are interested in, um, interactions across linguistic levels rather than a purely sort of bottom feeding the top type of approach to distribution learning may be more promising. Um, and that's the idea that I'm putting out here for, for Arvin. Thank you. Supervised training in that the learner does know whether two things are the same word or not, or it's unsupervised. It's it's supervised in the sense that the child would would figure out what a token means in the end. And, so, and actually, it does not have to know exactly what the token means. It only means that they say words like um, had or, or or hit mean different things. That's enough for it, right? That's enough for it. And uh, the uh, evidence from infant studies that I brought out was trying to say that they know some aspects of the meaning differences. That's the, exactly what they mean, I don't have to assume. I just assuming they know they're different. Uh, does one of the less commonly uh, referenced aspects of the Hill and Grant 1995 study is that um, he does a uh, uh, Supervised learning using quadratic um, discrimination right. uh, functions and uh, um, gets 97% correct identification in a, uh, with cross validation. Right. So, the, of course, that's using more than one point per vowel. Right. I've done a, the, right. the information, and, and there are other, uh, it's, in fact, just simple model with different. Uh, Single Gaussian per vowel similarly dynamic. So the, the, the information is there. The problem is uh, getting the clustering to work. Right. And I've done something like uh, by enhancing the, uh, uh, each token with some additional vectors to represent meanings. So, so uh, you know, you, you can maybe even do, do the meaning difference distributionally. And then, you know, recluster everything either, either using k-means or mixed Gaussian. And they do, don't seem to improve very much. Mark. Right, right.
Right. Uh, you should first of all, you should ask the the, the man to your left, who, who, by the way, just won the uh, Benjamin Franklin Medal in Computer and Computer Science, the same medal that Arvin won a few years ago. Um, um, they, they, um, the studies there was actually done both perception and articulation. So you heard articulation. So they've done perception again as well. Gone. Um, you know, two, two, two pronunciations, if there are, you know, if I say dog and my wife says dog, um, even though the acoustics are different, the child would actually, based on semantics or based on observation, would know they're talking about the same, we're talking about the same thing. So acoustic did, you know, difference does not mean uh, two different words. Yeah, right. The child would talk, talk. Right. 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 They, I'm assuming they can figure that out, you know, you know, somehow, right? So suppose we said, suppose we want to introduce the possibility that the child is more often right than not, mm -hmm. but not always right. Right. In, in making those judgments. Right. How robust is your model to detect to a certain amount of error? Right. Um, I, I've, I've played with that, actually. If you run this a, a bit longer, it, it, they all wash out. So as, as long as I assume the child is not is above chance at uh, at uh, knowing what you know which words which, and you run this a bit longer, they they can actually do more of the same thing. Yeah. So that even though there is a supervised learning aspect to it, does not have to be uh, right. It does not have to be a hundred percent right. You know from the get go. Yeah. That's probably good enough, which is what those experiments can show. Namely, they are better than chance at picking out, you know, banana or, or feet, right? So, so I'd imagine this is the ability that improves over time, but uh, maybe to get it going, you don't need to be, certainly you don't need to be 100% right. Um, that's not directly, you know, you know, supported, but I need it. The reason I need it is that I don't want to, I don't want to assume the child memory knows which of the tokens have been, hum, which tokens, or which subset of tokens are heard belong to a particular category. That's assuming the child is, is memorizing, you know, too much. But if you re memorize the very last one, okay, I, I sleep a little better. And at the same time, we do know there are recency effects in these, you know, examplers, um, you, you know, effects in our category. So even though I'm not aware of a direct, you know, study for six-month-old infants showing this example effect, but I'm pretty sure that's something we do eventually get. Um, I don't want that because um, because you only create you know categories when you encounter those minimal pairs. The most frequent word from a category may not be the most uh, may not be a relevant minimal pair, right? So the only minimal pair again marks linguistic distinctions. The whole idea here is that you learn from those linguistically meaningful units. Uh, well, you can do a stack, you, you, or, or, you, or, you, or you can do a list, right? Right. 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 Absolutely. No. Right. Uh, there is no uh, right. I have I have not tried it, but I would not. Uh, this is it's compatible with the story I'm telling. You can draw a probabilistic distribution over. Retrieval, you know, reliability over recency or frequency, and so on. That you can plug in some, you know, memory model, 
that, that could do that, then you would make this model more stochastic. Again, I think, you know, I tried some variants of it. In the long run, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference in the end. Yeah. But, that, but that's a good point. So that's maybe even, it's slightly more complicated than I'm doing here, but, it, but maybe even a better approximation of reality. Thank you.